My name is Deb Clemens. I am Assistant Director of Public and Academic Programs at the RISD Museum. Super excited for this conversation this evening um, with Anita and Sophia. What I'm gonna do right now is just share a couple things. I'm gonna share uh, the RISD Museum's land acknowledgement that um, staff have been working on for a, for a while and has been sent to um, uh, local tribal leaders for their review and, and feedback, um, honoring that this is an evolving um, document. And so I wanna share that with you tonight. I will then be introducing Sophia and Anita, letting you know a little bit about them. And then we will move on to the screening and conversation. Rhode Island School's design is built on what is now called College Hill, part of the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Nation. The only federally recognized tribe in Rhode Island, indigenous people from many nations near and far, live, study, and work in Providence today. RISD community members are committed to actively addressing the many violent legacies of colonialism in our daily work. The amplification of native voices and histories is crucial to rectifying the destructive past, and we gratefully acknowledge the ongoing critical contributions of indigenous people across our state, region, and nation. So this evening, I'm really excited again Sophia Nali Allison is an Academy Award nominated filmmaker and artist, queer radical dreamer. She imagines the archives, and forgive me, my internet connections. I'm so, she, she reimagines the archives by excavating hidden truths. A meditation of the spirit, her work conjures ancestral memories to explore the intersection of fiction and nonfiction storytelling. She was a 2020 United States Artist Fellow and is currently working on her first feature, Breathing and Levitating. Anita Bateman is an independent curator and art historian who specializes in modern and contemporary African art and the art of the African diaspora with additional interests in the history of photography, black feminism, and the role of social media and activism and contemporary art. Bateman earned a PhD in art history and visual culture and a graduate certificate in African and African American studies from Duke University, an MA in art history from Duke University, and a BA in art history cum laude from Williams College. She has held curatorial positions at the RISD Museum, the Williams College Museum of Art, and the National Museum of Art. And is the curator of Defying the Shadow and Black Fly, both currently on view at the RISD Museum. Thank you so much for the introduction, Deb. I, I appreciate it. Uh, tonight I'm coming to you from Providence, Rhode Island, which is the stolen lands of the Wampanoag and Narragansett people who I recognize as the original and continued stewards of this land. And before we officially begin, I wanted to pay respects to their elders past, present and future. I also want to invite those who are just now joining us to introduce themselves and where they're coming from in the chat. Thank you all again for choosing to join us tonight and a special thank you to Deb Clemens, Shannon Gunther, and Drew Brandt and the work behind the scenes to make this possible. Uh, thank you again for, uh, to Sophia for generously giving her time to be with us tonight and to thank talk you. about her work. Um, the structure of this program uh, will go as follows. Will Screen Dreaming gave us wings um, and that will be followed by a, a Q&A that will last for about 45 minutes. We'll reserve the last 15 of those minutes for audience contributions and questions. So please feel free to drop those in the chat. If there are any sort of technical questions, please um, you know, put that sort of issue in the chat and Deb will try to help you. Uh, and if there are no further delays, we'll get right to the screening. Sophia, if you wanna say a few opening words, you're welcome to do so. And if not, we'll turn it over to Deb again. Thank you, Noah. I'm just so grateful to be here with you all. Thank you so much for everyone that's joining today. I um, feel so honored to be in community with everyone. I will just say that this short film is a video essay. Um, you know, using written text, using my own personal memories to find the language to explore what it means to understand a truth that is not visible, is not tangible, and, and what that process of excavation looks like. Great. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, thank you. I remember the first time my body was weightless and free. 
floating past the heavens, slipping into the ether, transcending time and space. A conjuring so powerful, I felt my spirit force itself free from the body, dancing to the rhythm of the wind, surrendering to the air, allowing the spirit to move as it pleases. Memories, not my own, surrounding me. Voices, familiar and distant, navigating my movement. They say the people could fly, black folks. From slave narratives to folklore, they would lift right off the ground and fly back to Africa. They possessed a magic so rich, so deep, that it had been forcibly buried, wings clipped. But these stories are birthing their way to the surface, fiercely erupting the soil around them. Through these ancestral memories, where does fiction and myth become fact and dreaming a reality? The one thing you say about a myth is that there's some truth in there, no matter how bizarre they may seem. And the one that I had always heard that seemed like just a child's wish was the one about black people, black slaves, who came to the United States. And under certain circumstances, they would fly back to Africa. <laughs> when I looked at it more closely, I read a lot of those slave narratives, you know, that they published in the 30s. And the interviewer would ask certain basic questions and then some others. He always asked, he or she always asked that. Have you ever heard of flying Africans? <laughs> <laughs> or people taking up and flying back to Africa? And everybody, everybody said one of two things. No, I never saw any, but I heard about it. Yes. <laughs> or they said they had seen it. African folklore has filled my imagination since I was a young girl. My mom, a storyteller, wrapped my childhood in wonder. From talking animals to African spirituality, I believe and still do that these stories are rooted in truth. For centuries, stories of flying Africans have been passed down from generation to generation, evolving and shifting, but always the same, a liberatory mode of transportation towards freedom. These stories became a truth for survival, a secret language for runaway slaves, black mobility, speculative time traveling, and reclaiming ancestral powers. In 1803, they brought you here, prisoners stolen from Nigeria. You rebelled, your dignity and strength too powerful to be enslaved. Walking into the marshy waters of Dunbar Creek, you, Ebo, freed yourself. Drowning, flying, your chant still heard on St. Simon's Island. When I release my body, that is when it takes over. When my spirit breaks free and moves beyond my own understanding. I know flight to be true. I invoke the spirit and enter a meditative form of conjuring, a spiritual awakening where energy travels and ancestors speak. If energy cannot be created or destroyed, then the residue, particles, and remnants of the past and near future live among us, constantly overlapping with the present. I am a vessel, activating the stories, memories, and dreams of black women. My dreams are not my own, but the whispers of ancestral wisdom, tongues only decipherable to my spirit. As Tony K. Bambara said, when you dream, you dialogue with aspects of yourself that normally are not with you in the daytime, and you discover that you know a great deal more than you thought you did. My dreams are erupting, the surface cracking around me, free falling in each direction. Dreams are reality, time is relative, and the past, present, and future are melding together. What visions do the ancestors have for me? When I conjure the suppressed gifts of black women before me, how will I embody their secrets? No one archived your existence. What evidence do I show of your powers, your ability to disregard gravity, your spiritual wisdom? How did you find the strength to release the weight of the world and float past the highest mountains? What freed your spirit? I ask for freedom and healing. May you fly. May your dreams live through me and continue to thrive the energy rapid as it disrupts all that stands in your way. 
the black woman before me, after me, during my time. May you discover new ways for your wings to spread, to manifest your dreams. I remember the first time my body was aware of flight. Disbelief occurs, your feet searching for the ground. But soon, you give in to the universe and ancestors, slowly dissolving into the blue of the sky as you move further beyond the grasp of human reach. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Deb. Sophia, you. I'm so excited for your full-length feature film. Oh, thank you so much, Anita. Every time I see your work, I, I find something new that I love about it. And I really think that it needs to be sort of a full cinematic experience with, you know, sound wow. and, and, and the public clamoring the, to be next to it and in proximity uh, to it. That means so, more than you know, Anita. Thank you so much for those beautiful words. Of course, of course. So to begin, let's just talk about the beginning. Yeah. How did your creative practice get started and when did you know you wanted to be an artist? Yeah. Um, you know what? I grew up in a household of artists. My mom was and still is a storyteller. Um, I grew up in South Central and Lamert Park. So my mom was very active within the storytelling uh, community. And my dad was a musician. And so at a young age, I witnessed storytelling as a way to not only escape, but as a way to heal, as a way to envision a new liberated future, as a way to honor um, hidden truths and ancestral memories. My mom, a lot of her work was rooted within folklore. And so for me, I thought that I wanted to be a performer. I thought I wanted to be an actor. And I went to undergrad for to study theater. And then halfway through, I, I dropped out of school. I was like, this is not what I want to do at all. I want to tell stories, but I want to be in control of these stories, especially when uh, these stories are, are focused on existence and life of Black folks. You know, I, I'd seen too often how that work can be extractive. And I wanted there to be a new holistic approach to how we tell our stories. And so when I dropped out of school, I began teaching myself photography and cinematography, and then finally went back to undergrad to get my degree in photojournalism. I thought I wanted to work as a visual journalist in the community. I, my dream goal was LA Times. And I was turned down by the LA Times like three times in a row for internships. Um, but I didn't let that deter me. And I just realized there was something more expansive for me in journalism. I, I discovered was very restrictive. Um, I felt like there wasn't a lot of freedom for me to experiment as an artist. Um, and I had to really abide by these very strategic rules within journalism. And so I went to grad school to study documentary filmmaking. Um, and since then I have really been teaching myself how to incorporate these experimental methods within documentary, really wanting to see um, what happens when fiction and nonfiction are in conversation with each other and that the two can live together and speak with one another. So it was a lot of so many, I feel like I've lived so many different lives of discovering who I am, discovering, you know, my own identity, remembering my childhood, um, both the traumas of it the magical moments of it and letting that really inform what I'm supposed to do in life and how I'm supposed to use my work. Yeah, going back to the idea of merging fiction and nonfiction, when did you first encounter stories of Igbo landing mm -hmm. and, you know, this folklore of flying Africans? You know what, I definitely remember in childhood, during my childhood, learning of these stories um, because my mom had so many different books in the house of African folklore. Um, but it wasn't until I was in grad school and I was taking a black feminist course that these stories began to come back to me. And Anita, I really wish I could pinpoint why flying Africans was what stuck with me, but it just felt like 
a memory was coming back that I lost and, and it was a rebirth for myself. And for me, the idea of flight resembled liberation. I, um, in this course that I was taking, I discovered the historian Darlene Clark Hine, who speaks of the psychic space. Um, and I'll just read a quote of what the psychic space is. Um, she speaks about Black women who understood the culture of dissemblance. And she said, Black women, as a rule, developed and adhered to a culture of secrecy, a culture of dissemblance, to protect the sanctity of inner aspects of their lives. And so I began to think about, well, what is the psychic space? What is this realm that Black women, you know, go to for protection for themselves to live in the fullness of their being? Um, and that's when I began to think, well, how do we get there? We get there through flight. Whether, you know, flight is the literal essence of the body lifting from the earth, or if there are other ways that people have discovered that they need to remove themselves from this tangible realm. Um, and for me, flight made so much sense. It was having complete control over your psychic abilities, your physical ab abilities, and taking back that agency. Um, so as a young girl, I always heard these different stories of how, you know, Black folks, how the African diaspora existed in between these realms of magic and reality. Um, and so in grad school, I found for myself, I needed to create a psychic space to survive through that experience, to survive in a, in a you know, a very colonized program. I even took time off from grad school to uh, move back to LA and take a job within production. And I found myself really craving a space that I could be safe, um, that my imagination can be as radical and expansive as needed. And so that, that was how flight became this answer for me and you know, understanding the historical context of those that were enslaved, knowing that they had to fly back or that, you know, that also being interchangeable with them jumping off of the ship and drowning themselves, that reclaiming control over the body, reclaiming control over our, um, our ancestral abilities. It, it felt, it was the first time and it still is to this day, the only time I feel in complete control of my, my work. Um, I began doing these self-portraits because I wanted to put myself in front of the camera, just as I ask others to be in front of my camera. I wanted to experience what it means to be vulnerable, what it means to be honest, to be transparent. And for me, it gave me the agency I needed to create work without anyone's permission, without needing any, um, any equipment outside of my camera. So it felt very liberating for me and it's it remains a very liberating process. Yeah, that's great. And, and thinking about other um, creative black women thinkers and filmmakers, your, your work has such dynamic angles, you know, linking trees and nature and water in a way that's reminiscent of Julie Dash's Daughter of the Dust and Casey Lemons's Ease by You. And I'm wondering if you can talk about your greatest cinematic influences in addition to the influences that you've mentioned who uh, have influenced your thinking. Yeah, I absolutely am speechless and honored that you would consider my work to be in conversation with them. Um, when I first witnessed Eve's Bayou, I was a young girl. I may have been the same age as Journey in the film, or maybe just like a couple of years younger. And there was something just so haunting and magical and freeing about having these psychic abilities, but yet not understanding what to do with it and knowing that that was so deeply rooted within your own culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so that film has always been an inspiration for me. Daughters of the Dust, you know, Julie Dash, really, I feel like revolutionized cinema for, for Black women, for Black folks. Um, but for me as a young girl, I really loved films that just showed everyday life for Black people. I am a huge fan of Friday. I am a huge fan of Just Another Girl on the IRT. Um, 
And so movies like that growing up in South Central movies that I could identify with. And then these movies like Eve's Bayou that taught me these two worlds can exist together. You can live in the city, you can have, you know, your everyday black girl experience, but still find these moments of magic, still find these moments of ancestral guidance. And so for me, it's always been about, well, how do these two worlds collide and how do these two worlds live together? Um, but also just thinking about the work of Lorna Simpson, of Carrie Mae Weems, uh, them speaking so much to, to me as a young girl, not understanding the nuance of their work, or sorry, not understanding, um, I should say the fullness of their work, but understanding the nuance of this is how Black women exist in front of the camera and behind the camera. Yeah. yeah. And just a segue about or thinking through just the fullness of Black women's experiences, we know that we're living in a moment of, you know, Black girl magic and all of these sort of hashtags that uplift us, but at the same time sort of uh, speak about other sorts of ideas about Black womanhood. And so could you talk a little bit about the difference between the transcendental and spiritual nature of Black cultural ontology as it relates to, you know, our cultural practices and thinking about the fullness of our beliefs versus the stereotype of the magical Negro? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think when we think about the magical Negro, that is always in conversation with what of their abilities how are their abilities helping someone else, primarily helping you know, a white character, a white individual? And thinking about phrases such as black girl magic, understanding that this is an innate wisdom and um, energy that resides within us. And so something that I really have found myself challenging is even like the idea of the term black excellence, feeling like that excludes a lot of black folks of who gets to exist in this idea of excellence. But for me, black girl magic means come as you are. You know, you don't have to apologize. You don't have to make room for anyone. That to me is the most powerful way to think about language in the relationship to us tapping into that ancestral wisdom ancestral practices that allow us to awaken the spirit, that allow us to black uh, to tap into that black consciousness of our different psychic abilities. But for me, what makes me excited for black girl magic is any and every black girl can exist in that language and not wanting any black girl to feel like they have to shape shift who they are to be seen as exceptional for themselves. And I don't even, I hesitate to use the word exceptional. Um, but for me, I want, like, even when we think about black girls in the hood, everything about them, people have taken, you know, hoops, nails, the hair, everything that they resemble is a true authentic artistic self-expression of, of, of who they are. And for me, that is black girl magic. Um, and that is powerful. So I want the everyday Black girl, I want the everyday Black person to understand that they too can tap into these different abilities that allow for them to transcend beyond the physical realm. So can you speak a little um, more about your process in terms of technical effects of, of showing um, different uh, abilities, different psychic abilities in your photographs and your in your videos. Yeah. So what sort of techniques do you use to give the illusion of levitation and weightlessness in your photographs and, and how intense was that process of coming up with those techniques? Yeah, um, so I actually don't share how I do the photographs um, only because <laughs> I, you know what, I had an amazing professor, Lagaya Romero, I was in a, a course once, and some of my white classmates were asking how I created the image. And my professor was like, Sophia, you don't have to answer that and don't answer that for anyone. Just thinking about how, you know, historically, what we've taught ourselves has been stolen and other people take that and then, you know, co-opt it for themselves. So for me, I've, I've, had it remain as a secret for me. And I always tell people I am flying, but one day I would absolutely love to share, to teach other, you know, black girls, black women how to do that. I think I'm still just 
um, building my foundation within this work. But I can say that all of these photos, with the exception of two in my series, I have done alone. Um, I taught myself how to do it alone. I taught myself how to do the lighting because I realized what stops so many of us from creating is having access to equipment, having access to the funds. And when I started this series, I was experiencing that I didn't have the financial support that I needed to rent equipment. I didn't have um, the support I needed to hire a crew or hire, you know, people to come help me. So I taught myself, how do I just do this alone? So anytime I feel led or moved to create, I am able to. The two times that I have had someone with me, it was just to keep me safe, um, to make sure I wasn't, you know, harmed in the process because uh, sometimes it can get a little bit dangerous or sometimes I can't really pay attention to my environment. So wanting to make sure I'm safe. But I will say for the creative part, I do a lot of um, conjuring to allow the voices to speak to me of these Black women who want these stories to be heard. Um, sometimes I take one photo a year. Sometimes I may take two to three photos a year. But this project was the first time I removed the idea of a timeline. I, you know, am so used to you have to work within this time frame to create. And I wanted to allow myself to feel free to create whenever the spirit moved me to do that. Um, and so just through my own readings or research, sometimes an idea may come to me and I'll just let myself meditate on that idea. I begin doing research to see what stories I can link to it, um, what historical stories, what fictional stories, whether it's me making it up on my own or I have discovered a person that is in alignment, their, his, their historical story is in alignment with this vision that I have. Um, but it's been the most freeing experience and just letting these, I, I feel like ancestral memories come of ways in which black women have understood flight or used flight to free themselves, to breathe, to create, um, to escape trauma, to venture into other galaxies. And my process has been very, very holistic. I think the last time I created an image was 2020, but I'm very eager um, to get myself back into the mindset and, and the practice of, of really sitting with this work and creating new photos when, when the time is right. Thank you. So yeah. in the spirit of being holistic, you're working as a cinematographer, a producer, a director, a writer of your projects. And I'm wondering how you decide which projects to take on and what capacity you want to, um, or excuse me, what role you want to play when you decide on those projects? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, I will be completely transparent and say I've normally had to take on all, all of those roles out of necessity rather than a desire to do all of those roles. Um, my feature that I have coming out is the first time I was able to just be writer and director and an EP and not have the pressure of doing cinematography or editing. And I have loved, learned to love those crafts. I absolutely love editing. I love cinematography, but it's not my desire to do that for my work. I have done it because I understood what I needed in that time. And I, there were moments where I didn't have the language for the visions that I wanted to see. And so I just took it upon myself. Well, well I can do this technically. I'm still discovering what my visual, how to, to speak about this work, what the language looks like to translate to someone what I want to create. Um, so it's really helped me just grow in understanding what it is I want, what it is that, what my taste is. For me, editing is something that has always been really healing. I love the act of editing. I love the way it feels, just putting things together, creating a rhythm, but I am so happy that I can release carrying all of these roles. So I'll always continue to, to navigate between director and writer. And I don't see myself really editing or doing cinematography again until it's maybe a, a project that I decide I'm ready to do that. But 
um, I think it's very healthy to have a community to help navigate all of the different roles. It, it's very draining to try to do everything by yourself. Um, my studies in journalism and video and photojournalism taught me how to do everything by myself. So I'm grateful that I have those skills and learned how to do it. But I think for me to keep expanding, I had to release that control. Um, I had to understand what my strengths were and what I'm able to keep growing with. I've reached a point where I don't have the time to keep excelling in my own cinematography practice or my own work as an editor. And I'd rather work with people who, you know, do do that for a living, who do understand that language and the, the technical aspect of it. Um, but I am really grateful for these projects that I was able to do those roles because they were such, my past work is so intimate, is so personal. Um, and you get to be your own boss, but I am happy to release all of that um, control at the moment. Yeah, that's great. And it's great that yeah. you know how to compartmentalize what you have the bandwidth for versus yeah. you know, what you don't, because I feel like a lot of artists do burn out trying to be, you know, everything at all times when it relates to their practice. So I I'm definitely burned out. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy you're finding your boundaries. Thank so. you, Anita. Thank you. Yes. So going back to dreaming specific um, sort of points, the, the way you're using words is so wonderful. And it is very reminiscent of, you know, poetic storytelling, how sort of Toni Morrison is using words and you feature Toni Morrison. Um, so can you talk a little bit to the, the, the process or how you're approaching your writing and how you're approaching your filmmaking and what that relationship is between them and how they're reflecting each other. Yeah, there, there definitely is a deep relationship. This project right here was the first time I wrote a script for Dreaming Gave Us Wings. Um, I worked with my brilliant creative producer, Janice Duncan, and she really pushed me beyond my comfort level to, to really be honest with what I was saying, to really be intentional. I find that for me as a writer, I normally start it, by writing essays. I love essays. And then through that, my essays turn into poetry. Um, and I kind of take from that and then devour it into something that is a bit more accessible, um, that doesn't feel as academic. Um, so honored again for the Toni Morrison reference. But, you know, growing up, my mom was a writer, continues to be a writer. So she's featured in the film as, as well under the name Sybil Desta. That was an archival clip of her from when I was a child um, in her storytelling practice. And... I find that I, I need the time to, to write. And I think that's why, I, with the exception of, of my feature, I haven't done writing as like a professional thing for myself because I'm learning what my process looks like as a writer. I'm learning what time and support I need. Um, but I've been very fortunate for Janice Duncan with this project to work with me, sit with me, and all the times that I would get irritated or I was stressed or scared to be honest in the work. Um, I think it's it's been important for me to have someone I can trust to share these ideas with that will let me know when I need to um, go a bit deeper. But for, for me, you know, being really being inspired by writers like Zora Neale Hurston and Alice Walker, who are constantly letting these two worlds of fiction and real, reality live together. Um, and Anita, I realized I don't think I answered one part of your question earlier that kind of speaks to this, but this idea of these elements of like water and trees in the work. I'm sorry if I'm just thinking about what I saw in text, but I feel like you may have asked me that. And being so inspired by, you know, thinking when writing, thinking about, well, what are these hidden voices, what are these hidden messages that live within the elements that live around us? What are they saying? What have they witnessed? Um, 
there's a tree on this plantation in South Carolina, forgive me for not remembering the plantation, but they called it the witness tree. And just thinking about, well, what have rocks witnessed? What has, what, you know, the water holds our voices, it holds our memories. So being inspired by these elements and how those elements speak to us and what stories have black women buried for us because they weren't allowed to share them. And so now, you know, as a conduit, we're allowing their stories to speak through us and share them as well. Yeah, I wanna go back to your mention of your mother, Sybil, who's in the, in the film and the sort of the black women you're conjuring in your work. Um, and thinking about sort of your personal life, um, if it's okay to share uh, about your mother's diagnosis. Yes, yes. So she, is, she was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 48, and you present her story in a different work that uh, you create called uh, Portrait of My Mother. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the tension between keeping those moments, those intimate moments private and wanting to share those with the wider public, thinking about the things you've said about secrecy and, and holding Black women's memories close to, to heart. Um, yeah, what are your feelings uh, about that creative tension? That piece was so important to me because when I was a young girl, my mother was going through breast cancer when I was in middle school, I think the end of middle school going into high school. And I remember I carried such shame um, with that and I didn't want people to know what my family was experiencing. And I remember one day my best friend was asking me why my mom's hair was suddenly short and I just like brushed it off. And I was like, she just cut her hair. And then later throughout life, I, I became so angry with myself and ashamed of myself that I was embarrassed, you know, that my, that my mother had to go through that alone. Um, and so wanted to create an archive that felt holistic, create an archive that allowed us to talk, even if we weren't talking directly in conversation, it was, it's more of an interview, but that's how I felt comfortable speaking about it. It's, it's often very hard for me sometimes to be in normal conversation about these memories, um, just because of my own process of still healing. But for me to have an interview with my mom, it felt like a different way for me to carry this with her rather than a daughter. I could be an adult who was another black woman seeing her and acknowledging everything that she had to do shortly after my mom recovered from breast cancer. My dad died about a year later and my brother and I were still in high school. And so she had to put so much of her life on hold. We left Los Angeles, moved to Illinois, her storytelling she put on hold. And as I've matured and grown older, I just can't imagine what that must have been like to experience all of that with children. You know, she was such a vibrant artist and she is getting back, she's doing her storytelling again now. Um, and so for me, I, th I think this was, I needed, I wanted us to heal through this. And within this film, rather than making it solely about, you know, her diagnosis or her having to take care of us, I wanted it to, to be something for black women who, need to know it's okay not to be strong and it's okay when you are able to tap into that strength. I really want to debunk the idea of Black women always having to be strong, especially when it's not easy, especially when we are exhausted, when it is, you know, centuries and decades of weight that we are having to carry with us. Um, and it, it just felt important for me to archive a memory of how my mother moved through that time from myself to always return to as an adult. And for me to be able to one day continue to have these conversations beyond, beyond the camera. But for myself at that time, that was the only way I really knew how to do that, how to hold that space. Talking about holding space for Black loss is something that, um, you sort of conceptualized through love song through Latasha or love song for Latasha, excuse me. So I just wanna shift gears to focus on that for a bit because it's such an important work in, in memorializing 
both Latasha Carlin's life, but also her role in inciting the LA riots of 1992. So there's a point in the film where Latasha Harlan's, um, Latasha Harlan's friend Tybee is sort of recounting the moment in which she learns that her friend has been murdered. And her father, Tybee's father, is sort of preparing her for you know, the, the, this great tragedy. And you use animation as a, in the sequence where the father is telling her about Latasha. So you're intentionally not showing you know, the news footage, which is ind indicative of your using a trauma-informed approach um, that is sensitive to Latasha's um, circle of friends and family and their suffering in the Black community at large and how that information might re-traumatize us. And so I know you've spoken about interviewing Latasha's friends and, and making their memories of her the subject of the film due to the absence of home videos and, and footage of uh, Latasha herself. So for you, is there a difference in filmmaking when working with incomplete, insufficient footage um, versus consciously choosing to omit visual material, material due to their sensitive nature? Yeah, I think the two are definitely um, absolutely related. From the very beginning of A Love Song for Latasha, I knew that we could not use that footage. And what's interesting is that is the only footage that exists of Latasha. Um, and so for me, you know, it makes me begin so much of that process was informed by the work of Sadia Hartman of thinking about, well, how do we reimagine an archive when one doesn't exist? But just because there's that lack of tangible evidence doesn't mean that life was not actualized, doesn't mean these memories don't, you know, these memories hold the same weight as something that would be tangible. And for me, it was definitely a challenge of we don't have any footage to use of her. So what is the act and the process of conjuring these, these memories to create these impressions of that life, of that innocence, of that Black girlhood? And our decision to not include that video was deeply tied to wanting to remove the image of death from our story. Um, understanding how traumatizing it was for the Harlins family, how traumatizing it was for Ty, um, for the community, not wanting that to be the only way we remember her, not wanting Black girls or Black women to see this and think their life only matters if there's evidence of physical harm, but wanting our stories to exist way beyond the trauma and way after the trauma. Um, and so for me, I'm I'm consciously always looking at the archives and always listening for the stories that aren't there, um, that what could be here, what maybe once was here, and how do, do we as Black women insert ourselves into this narrative to create something that holds space for Black women in this time? Um, let me know if that answers your question, Anita. It does. Okay. I feel like um, just a quick shout out to Sadia Hartman's Wayward Live, What Beautiful yes. Lives, Wayward Experiments. I'm getting this wrong, but that is a book everyone uh, should read. It should be required reading um, for every level and, and every person who's interested in, in thinking about Black feminist um, reimaginings and, and liberation. So just a shout out to Sadia Hartman, who is giving us a language and a rhetoric to think about the archive and, and um, correcting erasure and, yes. and invention of, of Black womanhood in its entirety. We are 15, 10 minutes from, from um, eight o'clock. So I'm gonna turn it over to questions from our audience. Uh, we did receive a few um, that I will now read. And one of them is considering the historical function and impact of art produced for and by people of the African diaspora, do you feel that Afrofuturism and magical realism are a part of the same conversation? Can you read that question one more time, Anita? Yeah, sure. 
considering the historical function and impact of art produced for and by people of the African diaspora, do you feel that Afrofuturism and magical realism are part of the same conversation? I don't think they are. Um, something that I with more conversations I would love to see happen are around the fact that Afrofuturism is a term that was not even coined by Black folks. You know, a, a white man made that term. And so Afrofuturism was a word that I really clung to when I discovered it because I was like, oh, finally, I have language for what I'm doing. Um, but we've been doing this far beyond that language. And so for me, I, I feel a direct confrontation with using terminology of about our work that wasn't even created by us. So I would like to see more, I would like to see new language that we are creating to describe our work. Um, I love the term of magical realism for myself, but I, I think folks of the African diaspora have been doing this work beyond this language and I want us to continue being at the forefront of creating and conceptualizing what this visual language looks like, um, how to have these conversations about incorporating surrealism within our stories and us being able to exist with, within that world freely. Thank you. Yeah. It's another question coming from the audience. Um, as NFTs become increasingly trendy, do you feel optimistic about the market's potential impact and engagement with Afrofuturism or vice versa? I'm excited that Black artists will have ownership over their work, um, but I want to see more artists have the resources and the support needed to actually make a living from creating their work beyond just, we are acknowledging that you've created this, but how, how do black folks make money from creating? Um, how do we provide them with the resources needed to continue creating? I, I think there definitely can be, and I speak from experience, exhaustion with creating work that people may not recognize or people aren't quick to support. And so I think beyond just us having ownership, we need to make sure there is a foundation so that black artists can live comfortably while creating this. So that there is a reason, there, there, we're seeing a tangible, um, we're seeing tangible income for this ownership, not just your name is on here, we know who did it, but we want you to make a viable living for self. This is a magical realism question for you. Um, have you heard of any stories about enslaved people jumping into the ocean and becoming merfolk? I have, I definitely have heard of that. I haven't done much reading on it, but I do know that story deeply. My mom used to tell one, um, when I was a young girl. Judy says, Faith Ringgold won a Caldecott honor in 1992 for Tar Beach in which her characters fly in her dreams or fly in dreams, excuse me. Now I understand that a little better. It's such a beautiful book and the images from it are, are so magical and um, just really a healing story. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of, of stories from childhood, I know you talk a little bit about Virginia Hamilton's The People Could Fly and that yeah. being an inspiration. Um, so thinking about different sorts of literary references in your work and Virginia Hamilton specifically, there are more instances than you, we expect in which we see the, the, the folklore of the flying African. Yes. Hey. If there are any other questions, we have about five more minutes if you want to ask Sophia something. Otherwise, we can end a little bit early, get your evening started, maybe an early weekend. Um, but it's been so great to be in fellowship with you. And we look forward to your next project, your next feature. Um, one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. But how big were the people that were flying in your dream, someone asks? 
Mm. That's a beautiful question. I don't think I've ever thought about that, but for me, it's always my size or just the size, the typical size of a human. Um, but I think that's so fascinating to think beyond the size that I'm used to on this earth. So I'm going to sit with that question for a bit. Kalolo asks, could you both talk about working together as curator and artist? That's a good question. This is one of our first forays together seeing each other, actually. This um, is. Yeah, it's been a two-year process. I think our first conversation was in 2018. Um, and it was such it was a beautiful conversation, Anita. I remember just clicking with you and being so excited for what you were doing but I think just like life got crazy and busy and then COVID and it's so wonderful to see you face to face now. I know this is our first time seeing each other face to face everyone. So yes. this has really been not only a meeting of the minds, but just seeing someone who you admire and, and thinking about the conversation we had and, and vibing and whatnot. So this has been a great opportunity to just say hello and, and then think yes. with you about your work. Um, Thank in a more you. intimate way. So, yes, if there is anything you would like to shout out, Sophia, before we um, depart, let us know where we can follow you, follow your work, um, maybe think through how we can support you. That would be amazing. You're so sweet. If anyone would like to follow my work, you can always um, Find me on Instagram under Ya Girl Sophia. I'll put it in the chat. It's G U R L. Um, but I just want to thank you all, Anita, Deb, and Rizdi, for having me, for supporting this work, for this beautiful concept and show that you dreamt up, Anita. And I'm I'm so excited to continue watching what else you curate, and just feel really grateful for everyone that joined. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia, and yes. thank you to everyone who took the time out to, to be with us. Uh, we appreciate you so very much. And please follow Sophia's Instagram, her personal page, everything, because she is definitely going places and we love to see it. So thank you, Sophia. Thank you all. Have a beautiful night. All right, take care. All right, bye.